Australia is a vast nation with a series of distinct music scenes that often seem immiscible to one another. Brisbane with its famous yellow-orange sound, bright and dark, Leonard and McCartney as I used to call it. Sydney with its blue-collar rock hustle. Melbourne has a more chart-focused sound, more awake to whatever was trending and instantly it would seem a slew of bands would be formed up trying to hop on that chart based on the trend that was happening. Adelaide, like in many Sydney, and a farm team for great musicians in many bands. And Perth, most isolated city of over a million people in the world, it's always produced odd bod bands, including, to my mind of thinking, the greatest band this country has ever produced. And who produced what many people think is the greatest album ever produced by an Australian band. They made five albums in all, each one of them in their own way, stunning and wonderful. They wrote songs about uniquely Australian themes of lostness and disconnection from the modern world, and they contemplated the tyranny of distance, both in their yearning, country-flavoured arrangements, and David McCombs' often intricate lyrics. The bands they best resembled were Brisbane's Go-Betweens and their literate yet somehow distant pop, and Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, for whom they were almost a template. That band is called The Triffids, and the album we're going to look at is 1986's Born Sandy Devotional. Some albums are big and all-encompassing, some are small and intimate, and others are minutely personal. Some inhabit our world in places, names and times we can all identify with. Others, the places and times and names are changed to protect the innocent or to damn the guilty. Born Sandy Devotional is an album of scrutiny, inner and exterior, of actors who may be the singer or may not be the singer in any given song. The only constant is the palpable sense of loss, of distance, of destruction visited from without or within. It's an uncomfortably personal record where songs interlock and their relationships to one another can only be picked apart line by line. The opening tracks, The Seabirds, painted as it is behind a thin gauze of poetry, is a broad metaphor for the forces that drive us apart and then would tear us apart the way the hard-eyed birds could pick apart a corpse. McCombs lyrics here are dramatic, they're yearning, they have cinematic focus and they plot an inexorable doomward path. Estuary bed with its departure from innocence and sense of irreversible change, of choice to live in pain and without comfort of the sustaining balm of memory. This is the problem with albums made by junkies, is you have to be able to understand the progress and the locus of their addiction in order to be able to pinpoint the songs that they write at whatever point in the course that addiction is taking. Chicken Killer, with its ridiculously cheerful tune and rocking arrangement, is in fact perhaps the darkest song on the album, as low into the depravity of man as Nick Cave would ever reach. It asks, can a man satisfy himself through violence the same way he could redeem himself through love? Again, it's jam-packed with a uniquely Australian imagery, which makes it a deeply uncomfortable song for we, the naive, to listen to, as he revels in the depravity that that image surrounds. Keyboardist Jill Burt's ethereal vocal haunts another song of loss and desperation, Tallyrup Bridge, an enigmatic eulogy for anyone who's ever been driven over the edge, either literally or metaphorically. The overriding theme here seems to be revenge, either via living well or by causing drastic guilt. Lonely Stretch is bassist Martin Casey's Shining Hour, where 
His instrument is the engine that powers the song, although not nearly as intrusively, domineeringly, or cheesily as he did on perhaps the most famous bass line he ever played, that on Red Right Hand by Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, his employer after the Triffids. McComb captures the uniquely Australian sense of dislocation, both literal as he drives the Nullarbor at night, 1,600 kilometres of the most desolate road on earth, including a 125 kilometre dead straight stretch, but also that sense of not only not knowing where you are, but not knowing who you are anymore. Your mind starts to play tricks on you. Your headlights barrel dead ahead, but they reveal nothing. A lot of people I know who grew up with this record believe this is the finest track on it. Wide Open Road is the song which draws together all of the elements that make this album special and extraordinary. It's travelling motif, it's recognition that the roads that we travel from somewhere go somewhere, in this case somewhere dark, perhaps even murderous. and that emotional topography is as real as geographical topography. It's a huge song amongst all these small vignettes. It's every hope, heartache and hatred that we all hold somewhere in us. It's the lost seeking the lost and their lostness. It's Macomb's crowning hour as a vocalist. Drummer Alzi McDonald sounds huge and theatrical. It made number 26 in the UK and got the band on to Countdown locally and is still probably the best remembered artifact that the band left behind it. Life of Crime is a song of aching, of the battle between desire and its consequences, of risk and reward triumphing over the cold nights of the self. My chest burning, rising, falling sings Macomb. As I said, the problem with albums written by junkies is what is the true object of desire? The album turns on personal things, a sort of things done for the last time, of final undoings, of no regrets and the vices that help dim regrets. Dave McComb knew he was far from a perfect human being, but he still had no idea of the true depths he would sing to. This, at the moment, is my favourite song on the album. Stolen Property is almost a continuance of personal things. Macomb casts aside one relationship with someone he couldn't live with and proclaims her relationship with another person he couldn't live with himself. The stolen property is his soul, stolen back from whosoever he gave it to. It's the one thin glimmer of hope on the record. Jill Burt sings us out with the stunning and complex mini novel Tender is the Night or The Long Fidelity. A sensibly a summation of Macomb's relationship with his drug of choice and everything he abandons in making that choice, sparing nothing in his examination of his own greed and selfishness, but at the very end, the revelation of the reasons he chooses it. He sings, where you are, it will just be getting light. Abandoned by all he loved, he's simply burning up the remainder in the furnace of his chest, disappeared in all the pestilence that sudden pleasure brings. Delayed through record label politics upon release, the album made number 26 on the Australian charts, but it did best in Sweden, where it made number 18. The Triffids were from almost arriving there an enormously popular festival act in Europe drawing up to 100,000 people at huge festivals like Ross Kilney. The future? There was always some impediment. Some sense was the band was just what a group of friends did while they were waiting for the serious end of life to come around. They made three more albums, The Country Music of In The Pines, which was recorded in a shearer shed at the McCombs family property, the band living in the quarters they recorded in while waiting for Born Sandy Devotional to be put out, with a recording budget of $310 for food, $340 for alcohol, $240 for petrol, and $250 to make the actual album. 
Kalincha, jammed with possible hit singles, but the point that the cracks started to form in the band because Island Records, their label, were only talking to a comb, they were disregarding the rest of the band. And The Black Swan, which has been described as their white album, an edgy, jittery clash of styles. Steel guitarist Graham Lee described it as a mess, but at least it was their mess. It has giddying highs, like this title track, and piteous lows, in particular ill-chosen, ill-conceived and ill-arranged Elvis Presley cover. And then, after playing a gig to a handful of freezing students at the Australian National University in Canberra, the band took a break. And it seems they all simply found better things to do. Jill and Alzi married. Jill went back to school and qualified as an architect. Alzi became a lawyer at the Australian Equal Opportunities Commission. Robert, David's brother, became a high school geography teacher. Graham Lee got into running a record label and a promotions business in Melbourne. And David? David did what doomed poets do. Giving away music in 1992 and enrolling in university to study art history, David's vices, his constant drinking, amphetamine use and heroin abuse, caught up with him in 1996 when he developed cardiomyopathy and received a heart transplant. The abuse, however, particularly to his liver, continued unabated. In late January 1999, he was involved in a car accident, kept overnight in hospital, and released the next morning with minor bruises. Two days later, he was found dead in his living room from a heroin overdose. His ashes were scattered in the pine grove near Judah near the Shearer Shed where he and his best friends reminded themselves why they made music in the first place. They were very possibly Australia's greatest ever band and fashionable as they might be now, hardly anyone knows who they are. Fame was always for others more the Triffins. For them, being together and making something wonderful was a real object. God bless the good ship Trifford and all who sail upon them. They did that while they recorded that. Screen was written there.